Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. We have the perfect person today for that. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Steve Chu. He's founder of Bumblebee Linens and MyWifeQuitHerJob.com. Now, Steve's a smart dude. How do I know that? He's got a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Top that. He not only runs multiple six-figure businesses, but he's a hardware engineer by day, entrepreneur by night. In addition, being a husband and dad of two kids. We met at mastermind meeting that John Corker and I put together in San Francisco. Steve, good to see you again. Good to see you, man. I just want to uh, note, see, I, I use that hardware engineering degree very wisely in selling handkerchiefs at my store. So. <laughs> that background comes All in handy. All that education, yeah, it comes in handy, right? You know, I have a lot to talk to you and a lot of questions about, you know, running several multiple uh, six-figure businesses, your hardware business. You know, what's the hardest part about balancing two kids, multiple businesses, and full-time job for you? Okay, so the hardest part for me actually is making sure that my business ambitions don't kind of eat into my primary objective, which is hanging out with the kids and more time with family. Mm -hmm. There's this tendency to just want to grow your businesses faster and faster, putting in more time. And just recently, actually, I've had to step back, take a step back and go, hey, is this extra money really going to improve my life or should I just be volunteering at the school more often? I don't know if you get that too, Jeremy. How do you fight that? Because you do have, you have conversations with high level entrepreneurs every day and you hear, like I I read your webinar post, right? You're talking to an entrepreneur. He's like, these webinars, Steve, they're just doing amazing. You're like, maybe I should do webinars. So how do you fight that urge to just keep growing and spending more and more time? Yeah, so in regards to that webinar, so um, my buddies kept sending me their stats, so I ended up trying it. I know. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it did crazy. It did like $60,000 for like one and a half hours of work. Right. And I was like, okay, I, I can do another one. And so I ended up doing two more with similar results. Right. And finally, just recently, I decided that I did them like within two weeks yeah. apart. Yeah. And I decided that it wasn't something that I wanted to do that often. Yeah. Like maybe occasionally, you know, do it. Oh, okay, so here's the long-term plan with that. Yeah, go I was ahead. thinking, go ahead, yeah. yeah, just maybe do a couple of these at the beginning of the year, mm-hmm. uh, get that influx of cash, and then just kind of chill and work on some other stuff casually for the rest of the year. Right. So that's what I was thinking about doing in regards to the webinars. Uh, yeah, so in regards to how... But now, hold I on, keep, after you yeah. do that... Like that's what you're thinking, but it's sort. It sounds like it's a little bit addicting for you when you do a few that are successful to keep doing them. So you're still gonna stick it to is. that. It uh, is. The thing is, I don't particularly enjoy doing them. Mm. Like some people Why get not? this rush. Uh, I don't know. It's it's maybe because I can't see the audience. Mm. So if it was a live thing, I would have no problems doing this more often. But there's something like I'm talking to you and I can see your facial expressions. But when I'm giving one of these webinars, I have no idea what people are. It's just you talking. Yeah, it's just me talking. And yeah. that's just not appealing to me. Uh, the aftermath is very appealing to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Someone's thinking, but, Steve, you're an idiot. They're like yeah. an hour of work. You could do these once a week. So, so go yeah. back on to what you're talking about. Because obviously, how do you fight that urge to... Yeah, so fighting the urge, usually um, usually my wife kind of keeps me grounded a little bit. Yes. So she'll say mm-hmm. something like, hey, you know, you, I notice you're spending a lot more time. We're, we're not hanging out as much. Right. Um, so recently, I'll tell you what happened earlier yeah. this year, and you know this, Jeremy, I went down to four days a week at my job, and right. that Friday has been reserved pretty much for doing my businesses in the morning and then I hang out with my wife in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So little things like that, you know, as the businesses have grown, I've kind of taken a few concessions uh, here and there just to make sure that the work-life balance is still maintained. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really hard to just not get caught up in stuff that works, right? When you have something that works with your business, the tendency is to just press harder and harder and harder. I have a pretty good gauge based on my kids' also because they want their time and they'll say things to you like 
daddy, where were you? Or what, what, or what will something you? Something like that. Or yeah. you, are you going to be coming to my, my event, my performance at night? I, I never miss performances. I try never to miss performances. So the last time I actually accidentally scheduled a webinar on top of one of their performances. And like three days before the webinar, I decided to just change the, the date of the webinar. Yeah. Probably resulted in, you know, some lost attendance, but yeah. just a matter of keeping the priorities straight. Right, right. And how do you create space for obviously all of the different businesses and full-time job and, and everything? Yeah, so I run an e-commerce store, a blog, a podcast, and a course that teaches that stuff. So in terms of the e-commerce store, my wife pretty much runs that day to day. So we got a warehouse, we got employees that mm -hmm. are, you know, fulfilling orders and so she's pretty much on top of that. The only time I kind of intervene with that is when there's tech issues involved. So if the website needs a little revamping or whatnot, that's when I get involved. Yeah. I also handle all the pay-per-click marketing and all that stuff uh, for the store. Yeah. Uh, which kind of all is all intertwined with my blog. So on my blog for the people who aren't familiar with it, I use the blog to kind of talk about how I run the business. Yeah. So whenever I try something new with the store, I write about it on the blog. So yeah. it's all kind of related. For sure. Yeah, and that's on you know my wife quit her job. Dot com and there are some really extensive blog posts which I'm gonna ask about. Um, really interesting information. Um, but I want to talk about a little bit about the e-commerce portion of things, okay. Steve. And um, maybe I should have your wife on at some point. Does she go on any podcasts? She does not. She's actually very shy. She doesn't like going. So am I. Place. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so, what's a must for sellers to boost sales? Like, obviously, you started the Bumblebee Linens in 2007. How long ago That's was correct. it? Yeah, yeah, 2007. 2007. So, yeah. what what have what's worked throughout the years? Because I know obviously in the beginning certain things worked, and then now take me through maybe the evolution of what worked then and through today about boosting sales. Yeah, so just in terms of finding something that's going to sell, I think the most important aspect is finding something that's unique, you know, about your business. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the e-commerce landscape right now. What a lot of people are doing right now is just taking stuff that they're getting from China and just throwing it up on Amazon. Right. And it's it's doing well for a lot of people, but my opinion for that long term is unless you're kind of adding value or if you're selling unique products or or doing something or adding value, you're probably not going to be around in the long haul, yeah. right? So, for us, I think it's a short-term play. Like when people are doing that, short-term is not a long-term sustainable business. Short-term meaning probably under three years ish before mm -hmm. like everyone just starts doing the same thing right. and the margins start eroding. Right. So what we try to do with our business is we try to add value and and we try to do stuff that's hard to do. Yeah. And so I'll just give you an example. Yeah. Um, we actually custom personalize all of our stuff and that actually involves spending money on capital. We need to get the machines that do it. Someone needs to run these machines. Someone needs to press the final product before it's shipped out. Yeah. That's something that Amazon can't really take away from us yeah. because it's it's much harder to do. Yeah. There's a barrier of entry there. Yeah. There's a barrier of entry there. And we also try to pick one thing with our shop and just do it very well. Mm -hmm. So for our shop, our one thing is handkerchiefs. We carry the largest selection of handkerchiefs. Very niche product, right? right. Very niche product. Not a lot of stores sell them, and we just do it better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, talk about that. So you yeah. have that now. You're in 2007. Mm -hmm. What's working? Obviously, you've come to all these lessons and realizations now. What's some of the evolution of what worked to actually sell these yeah, handkerchiefs? Yeah. So I can tell you this, uh, over the years, so when we first started out, we were just a shop, right? Just a listing of products. We had our value propositions on every page that, you know, we specialize in handkerchiefs, we'll personalize everything for you. But what I've come to learn over the years is that getting the customer or getting them to be emotionally invested in your company has really helped in terms of word of mouth and in terms of just getting repeat customers in the first place. I'll just, I'll just give you a couple examples. Yeah. So when we started a blog and an email list where we've kind of, you know, when someone signs up, we actually tell them the story about how we started our store. We actually give them craft ideas. Like most of our people are wedding people. Yeah. And so a lot of these people also want to, they're like DIY wedding people. They want to make some of their own stuff to make it more meaningful, right? right? And so for those people, we actually offer craft tutorials. Hmm. 
we teach them how to kind of personalize their wedding using our products. And a lot of our customers like that. And so even though they might find a product somewhere else that's similar to ours, they'll come back to us because they learned how to do these tutorials. Right. And my wife actually wrote a bunch of these emails, and she writes in a very personal tone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like a conversational tone and not like we're uh, some big business or something like that, which we're not, of course. So just a very mom-and-pop personalized email to kind of engage the customer. Yeah. And then obviously – you have ways of coming, having come back uh, with email, but it sounds like early on and today you still use paid traffic sources, right? Oh yeah, we do. Yeah, we. Um, so again, this ties into my blog, but I try every single paid service out yeah. there. Uh, I don't know where you want to go with this. Like, what's working the best? Yeah, or? what's working the best? What, okay. what you've tried that people should maybe think about or steer clear of? Yeah. So if you're first starting out with your shop. I highly recommend like the PLAs, like Google Shopping, Shopping.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon product ads is not going to be around much longer. They canceled that. But basically, ads where you get to see the picture and the price mm -hmm. so that when someone sees that ad, they already know what the product is. They already know the price. So when they click on it, they're much more likely to buy because they already know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also run AdWords ads, uh, which are been around forever. The ones that uh, when someone's trying to search for something, your ad pops up. And since they're search intent for whatever they're looking for, they're much more likely to convert as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about uh, Facebook a little bit, which is something that we've been doing more and more of over the years. What, so the problem with Google Shopping ads and Google AdWords ads yeah. is so that… The group, when you say Google Shopping, the, the product listing ads? The product yeah. listing ads, yeah. Okay. So the problem with those is that the audience that you can reach is just limited by the number of searches, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah. So for example, if wedding handkerchiefs, which is what we sell, gets a thousand searches per month, we're never going to reach more than a thousand people a month. It's hard to scale it. It's hard to scale that, yeah. right? And so what's nice about other ad platforms like Facebook is it allows you to target your specific audience and potentially you know reach millions of people hundreds of thousands or millions of people mm -hmm. all potentially looking at your stuff yeah so I don't know how much depth you want to go into this Keep, yeah um, go ahead go all right it. so yeah. Facebook uh, I'll just I'll just run down one of our typical campaigns maybe yeah. that'll for be people helpful. actually running a business this is like the most exciting thing of all time <laughs> <laughs> so. so one of the benefits of Facebook is that you can really hone in on uh, your target audience. So we yeah. have we have a target customer in mind, right? We have yeah. someone who's engaged, uh, pretty much in their twenties or th maybe early thirties, mm -hmm. who are either from California, New York, or uh, certain parts of the South. Really, because that's where our main customers are for some reason. And we also target people who are wealthier. Um, because people who have more disposable income to kind of throw at weddings or, you know, on personalized stuff, right. uh, none of the stuff that we sell is really essential to a wedding, right? right. Yeah. So we target people who make more than $50,000. And we also target people who drive uh, luxury cars. Yeah. So How did you I do figure this all out? I mean, obviously, yeah. the regional thing is just... Is this an observation or did you one day just see why are we getting so many people from California and actually looking into the data or is it more is it more qualitative or quantitative? That you know, all that stuff related to uh, the states to target yeah. is all quantitative data just based on our customer database, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it was just natural to target those people. Yeah. Um, so, so those have been converting really well. Um, in terms of other targeting methods, we also target people who've just been to the website. So you uh, retarget so them. Retarget them, yeah. yeah. What's cool about Facebook now is that you can set a pixel and you can actually show a potential customer the exact products that they looked at in the ad. Mm, that's really cool. So, yeah, so let's say they looked at product A, B, and C. They're going to see an ad with product A, B, and C on it. They're much more likely to click on it and much more likely to convert. Mm hmm and uh, another feature of Facebook that's really cool also is look-alike audiences. So you mm. can upload your entire customer list. Facebook will give you a demographic that's within 1% of the people that you've uploaded. And then you can yeah. run ads on them as well. Yeah. So, What do you use for retargeting? I just use Power Editor. Yeah. 
And anything interesting, Steve, that you could think of with the the uh, profile that surprised you, like on Facebook that maybe you target, like obviously luxury cars is is one, but that's not so surprising because it's it's a wealthier. You're looking for a wealthier clientele. Anything like um, a certain career or a certain um, TV huh. show that someone likes or movie that correlates to your target audience that you find was interesting with your demographic? No, we didn't. Um, so I can give you one thing. So we, mm. we've also targeted people that read Brides Magazine. It's like, you know, in the wedding industry, it's pretty obvious based on what they're liking. So Brides Magazine, Modern Bride, all those things as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. Not so much some of the parameters that, that you were yeah. talking about. Uh, that's interesting though because with a wedding, like you have a certain time frame and if you don't yes. get it within that time frame, it's like they don't need you anymore if it's for a wedding obviously. That's correct. Yeah. So there's other classes of customers also, um, which if you want we can talk about yeah, go ahead. as well. Yeah, so one of the benefits of having your own shop also is that you have this opportunity to target B2B customers as well. Yeah, talk about right. that because I think people are thinking B2C and I know you have a uh, a bigger vision of getting more sales at once. So yeah, yeah talk totally. about that. Yeah, so what's nice about B2B customers is they're always coming back and they're always buying in bulk and you pretty much don't have to go out and seek these people. They're loyal to you. It's not like they're out price shopping because they're coming to you because you provide a service for them and you're reliable. Mm -hmm. And so for our store, we also target event planners uh, wedding planners, and we've actually gotten a decent amount of traction within hotels and airliners uh, of, of all places. Really? Yeah. So uh, one of our customers buys napkins from us for their jets, for their private nice. jet service. We also have a bunch of hotels and bed and breakfasts that use our stuff as well. And then, of course, the event planners and whatnot, they, they buy the handkerchiefs and whatnot. So, we, so the way we've, we find these people is Whenever someone places a large order, they get flagged in our system and we set them aside. Whenever people buy more than once, which as you mentioned is, is a little unusual, right? Unless they're getting divorced real quick and getting married. Horrible which is highly situation. Unlikely. Yeah, right. exactly. highly unlikely. Uh, so those people who buy more than once, that kind of tells you something, right? Especially since you're in the wedding industry. Right. Maybe they're doing this as their own business and they're buying supplies, mm. or they run some sort of larger business that requires our products. Mm -hmm. So we single out those people, and we contact them directly, offer them coupons, try to establish a conversation on the phone or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And you're good about this, because I know that you talk to your customers, actually, you guys talk to your customers on the phone. What have you Would discovered you? that's interesting from some of these conversations that shifted, whether it's a product or something you do? On the site. Yeah, I can tell you a good example. So yeah. what we found is that brides, they always wait till the last minute to do stuff. Always, right? And so they want something personalized, which takes time to, to get done. They want it last minute. And so one of the one of the things we changed on our website is one of our value propositions now is extremely fast turnaround times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You need something really quick, you just contact us on the phone, we'll make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our value propositions. Yeah. That came about because of all these phone conversations that we had. Right, they want it right away. Yeah. Yeah, so tell me, talk about the platforms, because I know that you, on your site, you talk about Amazon, you talk about eBay, your site, what, what platforms are, are you on, and what do you recommend others you know, test out? Yeah, um, so right now we're on our own open source site yeah. and we're also selling on Amazon. Uh, the reason we sell on Amazon is because the marketplace is just so huge yeah. and uh, it's it's really actually quite easy to make sales on there. It, it's almost like you can throw stuff on there and just by the sheer volume of people on there, you're going to make sales. Right. And of course, the reason why we have our own site is so that we can have access to our customers, our customer lists, yeah. so that we can kind of remarket to them yeah. and, and that sort of thing. So I think it's very important to have both. Yeah. Uh, was your question in regards to the actual platform? Yeah, like Amazon, okay. your own site, do you do you use eBay or do you recommend people try it or any other you know, shopping platform out there? Yeah, so it's a trade-off, right? So what's nice about Amazon is they can fulfill all your orders for yeah. you, which makes inventory management a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. You just set aside some product, you ship it to Amazon, they take care of everything. And so you can make additional money outside of your shop without much effort. Problem is when you go into eBay, 
then you have to start worrying about inventory across different channels. Yeah. You have to worry about fulfillment to a new platform. And eBay generally tends to have lower class customers, so to speak, or higher yeah. maintenance customers. Yeah. So it, it's really a trade-off. So They're that's more why bargain, we, bargain shoppers, maybe. Bargain shoppers, yeah, that sort of thing. So we made the choice just to go with Amazon in addition to our own shop just for our personal sanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so tell me about, do you do a lot of then FBA? Because it sounds like you have your own warehouse. You don't, you don't really, you wouldn't utilize that as much. Yeah, no, we definitely do everything FBA. And the reason is because when you're FBA, you get Prime. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they shop on Amazon, they just filter out all the non-Prime listings and go straight to Prime. Mm -hmm. So unless you're on there, so um, there's people that have measured this and the conversion rate is up to 3x the amount when you are a Prime, Prime. versus yeah. Yeah. You know, you're so methodical. That's what I love about you. It's probably your engineer mind. So I want you to walk me through the process of someone hits the site, right? How do you optimize the the product listing on the site, the checkout, and then what happens after when you're, you know, what materials you may put in the box or, you know, follow up sequence with them? Um, from A to Z. Let me give you the high level. Yeah, go ahead. Most of the shopping carts these days in terms of like the checkout flow and all that stuff mm -hmm. is pretty good at this point. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a high level on how we kind of bring customers in and kind of bring them yeah. back. So what we typically do is we buy ads and I'll just use Facebook as an example here. Sure. So it, it, it's all about getting an initial contact and getting them pixeled, so to speak, for retargeting. So we'll try Talk to steer dirty to me, Steve. When you, when you say pixel. <laughs> so that retargeting pixel that we're talking about. Yeah. So we want to engage the customer initially through some piece of content. Okay. And so, yeah. so for example, we'll run an ad to a landing page that gives a, a decent amount of informational content. So just to give you an example, we have this post called nine unique ways to make your wedding extra special you yeah. know from a diy perspective love it yeah, and on their copywriting i love it go on yeah, yeah. i mean we do a lot of copy i mean that, yeah. that's selling is 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 not just listing your products on a site right it's yeah. about um a, a lot there's a lot of copy and stuff involved so in that article we kind of talk about our products we put some of the good ideas from our you know crafts that my wife has put together and we basically flood that page with email sign up forms and we also pixel them so we can run ads to them later on. Okay, and so in the event that they don't sign up for our email list or anything, yeah. we still can show ads very subtly in the background uh, retargeting. Mm -hmm. okay. In the event, though, that they do sign up for our email list, we offer a freebie, which is a book of crafts. And then we have an email autoresponder sequence that right now is 20 emails long mm -hmm. going out once a week. Mm -hmm. That kind of talks about our company. We provide more crafts, and then kind of interspersed in there are links back to our shop, where they're incentivized to make a purchase. Mm -hmm. So it's really sprinkled in with the content. Most of it's content. Yeah, yeah. Um, so those people that actually end up clicking on a product or looking at a product, as I mentioned before, we have Facebook ads that show them exactly what product they were looking at and right. kind of entice them get back. We also have Google retargeting ads, and uh, I don't know how sophisticated your your, your yeah. listenership is, but you know, on all these blogs, they have AdSense boxes, right? AdSense ads, right? And Google pretty much has reach, I would say, over the majority of websites on the internet. And so, same thing. Once you've pixeled that those people, you can actually show the exact same products that they were looking at on practically every single website. You know, out there on the across internet. the web, yeah, right. And so, it's it's like a war of attrition, right? So people might not be ready to buy something right away, right. but if you keep hitting them with emails, you keep yeah. hitting them with very subtle ads. Eventually, when it comes time, they they're interested in your product, they'll come and buy. Right. Yeah. So so now they buy, right? Okay. So now they buy. Yeah. And there's a number of things that you can do after as well. So you can run like a win back campaign. So let's say they haven't ordered in 30 to 60 days. Mm -hmm. You can hit them up with another offer just to try to get them back in the store. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of email programs out there that kind of automate this for it. So we use Klaviyo and 
Clavio, what it does is it compiles all of your orders, all of your customers, everything, so that you can just hit them. So I can say, hey, someone who hasn't ordered in two months, ordered handkerchiefs, um, ordered more than 50 bucks, it'll compile a nice little list, and then I can just fire off an offer, a very specific offer just mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. that subset of people. Which does it do? Fun. Does it do like cart abandonment too, or do you use anything for it that? It does. It does cart abandonment also. So that's a different thing. Yeah, if they've started checkout and I have their email, uh, what will happen is two hours later, I'll show them an email with the exact contents of their shopping cart and a one-time link, where if they click on it, it just takes them right back to the to checkout with everything that was in their shopping cart. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have another email that goes out a. I think a day later, if they still haven't checked out, another friendly reminder email. Mm -hmm. So, so let's say they purchase. Um, you send them something else to, you know, another offer. What about anything in the actual box that you do that you send off? We actually don't do anything special with within the box, mm -hmm. actually. So, um, just just a standard invoice with our contact information. Uh, we're not really big on coupons. I know a lot of people like to put in coupons, but uh, what we try to avoid there is people kind of depending on the coupons. Right. To shop. So that's why in the abandoned cart sequence, uh, one of the best practices that that a lot of people say to do is you know in that last abandoned email include some sort of coupon or offer just to close a deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we chose not to do that because we don't want to train people to just wait for that email once it becomes well known. People talk, so yeah. So, what's the biggest challenge within that that process for you? What what seems to be sticking points? Not just for you, but I'm sure for most people. So, I would say the biggest challenge in terms of putting together all the copy is deciding who you want to target. Mm. Meaning, what tone do you write the emails to kind of extract the most the most feedback? So I'll give you an example. So my wife usually writes the emails, and then occasionally I'll write one. Mm -hmm. And I remember this is one email that I wrote. I think it was for Father's Day or something. It just did not strike a chord because <laughs> I used my kind of it's your the way your I write, tone and language. It's my tone. Yeah, it's my tone and language. And it's a little, if you've gotten emails from me, it's a little, it uses humor, it's a little offbeat, and that did not go well. Like, a lot of people mark that email as spam. <laughs> what, did so, you, what did you say in it? <laughs> I, I just, so you've, have you had Neville Medora on your show? I've, I've interviewed him, yes. Okay, so I followed his ADA formula, uh -huh. so, which attention, is uh, attention, interest, desire, uh, action. Desire, action, yeah. Yep. So I came up with something funny to get their attention. Mm -hmm. And talked about the product. In the end, I just had a an offer, essentially, and it, it just it just didn't go well. Maybe it's because my wife had been writing all the other autoresponder sequences, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there was this email that was just completely in a different tone. Mm -hmm. But it just did not work out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that doesn't get talked about as much as it should, as far as when we have an e-commerce conversation about the how important the content and the stories are. And I know that you do a lot of that with your the bumpy linens and also the my wife quits her job you know quit her job uh as well you know i have a big star here that i want to make sure i don't miss because you mentioned clavio you mentioned a few others i want to know what software you use to run your business mm -hmm. and if you were starting over if any of those things would change today oh yeah so, yeah for sure so, so yeah what do you use first and yeah, so for our shopping cart, we use a very heavily modified version of OS Commerce, and I do not advise Only anyone. Only Stanford engineers can yeah. can you do that? I don't advise anyone go with that platform. It's okay. just over the years I've added so many features onto it. It's not even like the original platform anymore. Right. Uh, for me personally, I like to have all the source code so I can do whatever I want to it. Mm -hmm. um, but today, if I were to tell someone who has very little technical experience. I would tell them to go with a Shopify or a Big Commerce. Mm -hmm. Basically, they take care of the server, the shopping cart, everything for right. you, and you just focus on the selling. Right. I want to yeah. stick on that for a second. I know you have other software you use, but so if someone's debating between the two, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Shopify, Big Commerce. Yeah, I have my own personal. Yeah, this is all uh, about you, Steve. So. Yeah. Oh, is yeah. it okay? Okay. Yeah. That's all about your listeners. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, but they want to hear from you. You're the expert, so. 
I think Shopify is better from an aesthetic perspective, and I think they have a large, larger third-party ecosystem, yeah. so to speak. What so I if they don't, need modification, people need modifications yes. type of thing? Okay. Chances are they'll be able to find a plugin for it. Mm -hmm. What I don't like about them is mm -hmm. that you get nickel and dimed. Mm. So you get a base cart, and then you end up having to buy all these plugins that all have monthly fees, mm -hmm. and it just slowly adds up. Yeah. Uh, whereas Big Commerce, they don't have as many third-party developers, but just out of the box, the cart is a, it has almost every feature that you would need yeah. out of the box. Yeah. Um, but just from an aesthetic perspective, isn't as good, in my opinion, you like Shopify. Shopify. I like Shopify just for the sheer number of people developing themes and plugins for it. Yeah, yeah. I just don't like getting nickel and dime. Yeah, yeah. So, so you've convinced me about big commerce, um, whether you meant to or not, um, on that end. But um, so that's the shopping cart. What else? What other software do you use to to run the e-commerce? Yeah, so we use a shipping program mm -hmm. called uh, Shipping Easy. Basically, it allows you to just ship FedEx, UPS, and, and USPS all from a single interface. Mm -hmm. um, also gives you discounts on USPS. And you still use that today? Like, obviously, you use that now. Yeah, we use that today. You use that today, yeah. okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, email, Klaviyo, is actually something I recently changed to. Really? We used to be on Aweber, but Klaviyo is, is designed. Oh, so you switched to everything to Klaviyo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because Clavio handles everything. It's hmm. a little pricey, but just the fact that it can it has a database of every single transaction. And it has like it was designed for e commerce, so it has a push button abandoned cart sequence that you can use, mm. push button, cool. win back campaigns, everything. Yeah. Was that a uh, hard switch to make from A Weber to Clavio? It was a pain in the butt. I had to spend an entire weekend doing the implementation moving everything over yeah and yeah it's it's not trivial i i don't know if they'll do it for you yeah i don't like know for a lay yeah. person not like engineer who codes up okay oh, yes yeah, so you know for shopping it'll probably take longer than a weekend I it's really say. easy for a lay person is if it was okay. the right shopping cart okay. like if they chose shopify or big commerce just use the plugin i it's see free. i see but because we were on something custom and again, this is this is why I would not advise anyone do what I do because it was a custom cart. I had yeah. to do everything manually. Right. Yeah. And then, what about for the info for the my wife quit her job? Do you do you use a Weber still, or do you switch to Clavio also? No. So Clavio is meant for e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, my my needs for the blog are a lot less. Mm -hmm. I only sell one product, and then I have a newsletter. So a Weber is still working for me there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But should I decide later on that I want to sell, you know, five or ten different products, then it would probably be time to switch to something where I can track everything more, uh, more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, you use? use? I'm just curious. What's that? What do you use for for email? Um, a Weber. A Weber. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's certain lists I have actually on Mailchimp, um, just because they've been there for a long time. But most of my lists are on A Weber. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I just find it to be, I don't know, the, um, you know, I know a lot of people use Infusionsoft or Aweber or Entreport. Um, I, I'm like you. The mentality is like I want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And Aweber, that's, you know, for me, it's so simple to use. I'm thinking about moving to ConvertKit. I just want to give Nathan Barry a shout out. ConvertKit. Um, ConvertKit why, yeah. why are you thinking? Tell me about that. So a lot of people who blog, at least, they want something in between AWeber and Infusionsoft, right? Okay. Yeah. There's this fear with Infusionsoft that it's just really complicated, and you actually need to hire someone to help get set up, right? Yes, for sure. Biggest weakness of AWeber is that you can't tag the people that you yeah. want, right? You can't, so, yeah, select and narrow. So you're sending, like you're saying with Clavio, you can send a really yeah. pointed email to a certain population. Right. Uh, the other disadvantage, and it's a pain in the ass for me right now, whenever I run a webinar, I create a new list for that webinar, but I could have duplicates from mm -hmm. other lists going to that right. webinar. I'm paying for both, Yeah. which which just should not happen. That makes right? sense. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, what would Dan Fagella say about that? <laughs> Dan Fagella uses Infusionsoft. He does. So. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. But uh, ConvertKit, and I've had these conversations with Nathan. I'm not affiliated with it in any way, but... Yeah. It's basically a Weber, where you can tag people. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no um, 
shopping cart or whatever that Infusionsoft has. It's basically a step above Aweber, and it's priced similarly. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's worth testing out for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's email, shipping, shopping cart. What else? Shipping, shopping cart, all of the different um, paperclip platforms. Mm -hmm. So we got Bing, we got Google, we got Facebook, we got Pinterest. Uh, I don't know if those are tools. Pinterest I guess. is it's, huge for you, right? Pinterest has been doing well for us, yeah. Uh, we've actually started running Pinterest ads within the last three or four months, mm. and they've been converting pretty well. Really? So I don't have enough data to – I haven't written the blog post yet for it because I'm still collecting data. Yeah. It seems to be kind of hit or miss. Like I'll have a pin that just does really well, and then I'll have another one that just mm. – Zero conversions. It's like the stock market, like it all evens out to like a plus, but there's some big winners and some big losers type of thing. There are, but the difference is like when I do AdWords, I can usually check the searches and kind of gradually refine everything yeah. until it makes money. But with Pinterest, for some reason right now is, you know, it's like black or white. It's and either good or not good. Yeah, and I and I... I don't know how to tweak everything just yet, but when I figure it out, there'll be a blog post coming. Do you think it's because sure. it's a newer platform? Why do you think? You know, the, the platform itself actually is is not great right now. I, I, For I, ads, you mean? I'm positive that yeah. it's getting better over time. Just even the tracking is a little bit clunky. Um, for orders. So I end up just double tracking using their tracking mechanism as well as my own on analytics. Mm. And so... I'm um, still doing experiments. I don't have anything conclusive to uh, to share yet. Yeah. So I want to stick on the ads for a second, Steve. Okay. So optimizing, okay? Because it's not like you have like a $500 product here. You know, it's you your product. Someone may buy. What what's an average order? Like thirty dollars. Like between 50, 50 and sixty. Bucks. Fifty and sixty dollars. Um, and some of the you know the items are fifteen dollars. You know, so mm -hmm. how hard is it to optimize to get it so it's profitable? And what do you look at to actually get it to that point? Yeah, so some of the advantages of the products that we sell are they don't have huge search volume, right? And so as a result, the bids for these clicks mm. aren't that high. So just to give you an example for some of our handkerchiefs and whatnot, for the stuff that's like 15 or 20 bucks, we end up paying like between 30 and 40 cents a click. Mm -hmm. And our conversion rate's really high because we're the best at that particular product. Yeah. Um, likewise, with services like Google Shopping, Conversion rate's super high, so you know you can get away with paying more per click there. Yeah. When it comes to like the content-based advertising platforms, though, you really have to do a lot of the stuff on the back end and bring them back in order to make it worth it. Mm -hmm. So, so when I run an example, the, the content-based, what would that look like? Like the one I've already said in this interview, mm -hmm. right? Where you have a nice piece of content, you pixel them, you convince them to click on your products, and if they don't buy right away you bring them back yeah. to your site, whether it yeah. be by email or, or remarketing. Yeah. And that's just the way it's gotta, gotta work for content because a lot of times, you know, you're surfing on Facebook, you might not necessarily be ready to buy anything, right? You're there to check out cats or, or whatever you're into, Jeremy. <laughs> not cats, know. but yes. Not cats, <laughs> right, and so you gotta catch them at the right time. And so right. that's why you gotta keep them on for a long period. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just the nature of the yeah. game. So. Uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, okay. So for something high ticket item like my course, which yeah. sells for like a thousand bucks, I can afford to just right. spend a lot of money. Exactly. Um, and and break even. Like I gotta. Yeah. That's why it's interesting yeah. about the e-commerce because they're lower ticket items. So if you're optimizing that, for, it must be a piece of cake to optimize a thousand dollar info product. Yeah, it's much easier for your store. That's why you got to play all these back end games. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, another thing also is just through your content, you're kind of building an audience at the same time. Yeah. So there's a lot of benefits, right? You're going to be getting page likes to your to your fan page. You're going to be just kind of generating some goodwill with the with the content that you're giving out. And so when you right. do give that offer, the conversion rate is just going to be a lot higher because they feel like they know you as a business. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you learn? Is it your brother-in-law who was at the time when you first started was working for Google? Or Google, uh, Google AdWords. Oh or? yeah, yeah, yeah. He's actually still there. Okay. Um, so yeah, what did yeah, you learn so from him that we should? He know? just taught me about AdWords in general. So when we first launched our store, this is yeah. back in 2007. I had no idea. Uh, so my strategy for getting customers in the door was I was going to pretend to be a female, 
go on the wedding <laughs> forums and bring people back that way. That that was my first strategy. It actually worked. I just picture you in a wig and you know like a dress or something. <laughs> but. I had an alias. I'm sure my posts are still on there. Um, but you know, I would pretend to be a bride and I'd be like, "Oh, where can I get these? You know, handkerchiefs for a wedding." <laughs> That's hilarious. And then people would give me advice, and then later on, I would come back and I'd chime in, "Hey, I ended up getting it from this place. It turns right. out pretty good." And what do you think? I'd post a picture and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, so then I talked to my brother-in-law, and he was like, hey, you know, AdWords, have, have you tried it? And I was like, no, I've been just trying to rank naturally in search. And yeah. then he showed me a couple of things, and I just ran with it. And that yeah. ended up being a pretty big driver for sales early on yeah. for our business. Yeah. So you talked about establishing a name and getting content out there. Talk to me. How would you come up with Bumblebee Linens? And then what's your your take on getting – your name out there. So, uh, so the na- the way we came up with that name was uh, my wife. She got laser eye surgery, and she ended up having to wear these like big bug eye things over her <laughs> eyes. And so I just used to just make fun of her and call her Bumblebee during that <laughs> week long recovery period. And so that's not uh, what I was expecting at all. Yeah, it's, but... it's a completely random. Uh... <laughs> I wanted. Do you have pictures of that? That would be a great uh, email post. Like. Here's why we call Bumblebee Linen. So the picture of your, that's your wife actually would, a pretty good idea. Your yeah. wife would probably never let you get away with that, but I'd lo- I'd read that post. <laughs> yeah, that's actually not a bad. I, I'm pretty sure I could dig up a couple photos. Um, but yeah, that's how we came up with the name. Nothing nothing special. It had a good ring to it, I think. I do. I think it is good. Um, so talk about establishing a name, getting the word out, because I know initially, I've heard you say over and over, you don't love telling your story. You just love kind of the different just getting to business in the process but not the, the stories so you're talking about just getting the name about the e-commerce store or are we talking about You're's, like the blog or yeah the blog the store whatever yeah whatever fits yeah so for the store our strategy mainly was to get everyone on board via word of mouth by just offering incredible customer service mm-hmm. so we have people who don't like our products and they complain and we just let them keep it and we give them a full refund, stuff like that. Right. We've gone out of our way to make sure stuff has arrived on time. I can tell you a quick story here yeah. where one time a bride who was just kind of in our local neighborhood, maybe a half hour away by car, she ordered like Friday and she needed something personalized and shipped to her by Saturday morning, wow. which was pretty much impossible. <laughs> so we ended up driving it over. Wow. And I'm sure she talked about us after that. We did a lot of those things early on to just kind of get the word of mouth going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of telling our story, I've kind of reserved those stories for the blog and my wife quit her job because mm-hmm. uh, that blog is really, it, it just kind of chronicles our our story, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't put as much of that on the e-commerce store. I, I focus more of that on, on you know, the personal blog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So any other software things, tools you use to run the e-commerce business that people should know about? Yeah, I'm trying to think. So we use this uh, uh, phone app that keeps track of our business expenses hmm. that, that comes in real handy. Um, uh, we can talk about sourcing, I guess. Yeah, sourcing. So we use um, a tool called Pangeva, which allows you to kind of peer into where other people are getting this stuff from. Oh, cool. We occasionally use Alibaba. We uh, we go to the Canton Fair, which is in China, uh, every other year or mm-hmm. every second year, mm-hmm. which is a place where all these Chinese vendors get together. They have all their samples all together, and you can just visit hundreds all at once. Yeah, it really saves a whole lot of time. So what do you get? Think- what do you get out of that? Talk about the Canton Fair for a second, because. You know, obviously, you're selling handkerchiefs. Like, how much does it change from year to year? Why do you find it to be valuable to go every other year? Why? Yeah, so two reasons. One, we want to just, you know, hang out with our vendors a little bit more. Mm-hmm. What we've found over the years is that you get a lot better service from your Chinese vendors yeah. if you have that face to face contact, if you've already established a rapport. Mm-hmm. Because in the beginning, we were getting sent kind of marginal product. And once we started kind of visiting them on a regular basis, they now come to us when they have bargains or some new product mm. they show us first. Yeah. And they end up sending us better quality product. Yeah. Okay. The second reason we go is because the only way to kind of expand your store once 
once you've kind of saturated your market, so to speak, is to sell new products, right? right? And so we're constantly on the lookout for new stuff that we can carry in our store. So this past year, we launched uh, a personalized apron line. Mm. So like mommy and me aprons. So nice. you can purchase a matching apron for the for the mom and the daughter, and then you can personalize their names on it. Yeah. And that's been doing pretty well for yeah. us. So stuff what, like that. What are some challenges with sourcing that people should look out for when they're first sourcing or even even now? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a interview in itself. Yeah. But just to kind of summarize, there's a lot of cultural differences. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what's a cultural difference? What would be an example? You don't want to be like American, so to speak. I, <laughs> like you want me to look you? like you? Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you don't want to be just too direct to the point. Like you want to, you want to be very professional, and and you don't haggle on price in the very beginning. It's it's all about the relationship. Contracts mean nothing. So instead of haggling and stuff, what I usually do is I try to get multiple quotes from a bunch of different vendors, and mm-hmm. then just kind of piece together what the what the price is going to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not really pushy on certain things. I uh, so here's another thing that's that's very important. Yeah. You have to specify everything to the detail. So for example, we sell napkins in our store. Now you would think it's just a piece of square fabric. Right. But you have to specify the color, you got to specify the the fabric, the thickness, um how it's going to be delivered, the packaging, everything because if you don't specify everything, they will just kind of gloss over the details and just ship mm-hmm. it to you however they however they want. Right, right. Whereas I feel like the people in the U.S. that we've worked with, usually you, they ask you the details, some that you might not even have thought of. They're walking of. you through it more than just what do you want and sending it to you. Right. Yeah. So the difference is when you're and, – and of course I'm generalizing here. Not, not all Asian vendors are like sure. this. But if you don't end up specifying everything, they'll try to cut corners and, and give you what you want because you didn't specify yeah. something. Now do you recommend – is there any like intermediary that people can use – to like have someone on site there obviously you go over there but if someone maybe they don't want to yeah. go over there they can't is there some something like that so it, it all starts with uh having this checklist of stuff that you want in your product that mm-hmm. you kind of convey to your vendor yeah and then once the product is manufactured and ready you can pay a small amount of money and have an inspector sent over mm-hmm. to the warehouse yeah and just take a look like yeah. what they'll do is if you have a huge shipment, they'll spot check everything. Yeah. Because you're to making make, a huge investment, you know? You are. You yeah. are for sure. And so you have this list that you've already prepared on what your product should look like. Yeah. You give that over to the inspector. They spot check stuff. And if there's a problem, you can track it down before it gets shipped over to the U.S. Because mm-hmm. uh, once it makes it to the U.S., there's not that much There's not much you can do yeah. at that point. Right. So Steve, talk about, you know, you mentioned expanding the store and that's big, right? So what things, what are best sellers and what what's, has surprised you with what's actually sold or not sold that you thought would? Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to answer that question exactly, but I'll just give you an example of something that was unexpected. Yeah. So initially when we first launched our store, we were not actually targeting wedding people. So we were actually targeting embroiderists and people who would use our products to make stuff. Hmm. And so same exact product positioned a different way yeah. was not making sales. And it was only after we positioned it towards weddings and other special occasions did the sales actually start rolling hmm. in. Love that, yeah. So what's funny about that is in our store, we sell the exact same products across different categories, but we change the verbiage a little bit hmm. so that it applies to different different people that might be interested in it mm-hmm so that's great I love that it goes in that you're like a copywriting master over there so I'm not a copywriting master but I have learned to to choose like a target customer and then yeah. tailor a certain page for that yeah 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 so what's next like obviously expanding the store what what products do you see that you're gonna test out and and how how much do you go to test out because obviously it's capital to you know that you could be spending on something else yeah so in terms of the store we usually just 
always start out with like a small test order just mm -hmm. to see if things are going to sell. We'll just throw some ads at it and see if it sells. And only after that initial order sells do we actually place that bulk order. So yeah. it's it's pretty safe the way we proceed there. Yeah. Um, and in terms of future expansion, typically my my wife's in charge of all the product selection because yeah. I, it's it's not my. I wouldn't you know, mind you choosing any. Yeah, lens, exactly. Actually. Yeah, Come you don't want to be writing it. emails either, right? So. <laughs> don't write emails. Don't choose lens. Just optimize, Steve. Go in the corner <laughs> and optimize the ads. Um, so as we talk, Steve, it makes me think of one thing is most people talking about this stuff aren't as open as you. you know, And especially someone who teaches a course on it, they're not as open as you because they're worried about whatever it is. Someone knocking them off or doing what they're doing. Why are you so open about all this? Um, that's an interesting question. So I, I'm open about it for, for a couple of reasons, I guess. Mm. One is, you know, I just want to document this stuff on the blog, right? Yeah. And then two, I have found that being open has had a positive effect on sales, Yeah. right? People see what you're talking about and you go into extreme detail and then they start wondering, wow, you know, this full blown course probably has a lot of the same stuff that's awesome if this is just a small tidbit of it. Mm -hmm. And it's counterintuitive actually, right? It is, yeah. It's it's counterintuitive, but the it seems like the more detail I give, the more signups that I get. Mm -hmm. Um and this kind of goes back to the webinar that we were talking about. Yeah. A lot of people came up to me and said, Hey Steve, you know, this webinar was ridiculous. You you added so much detail and so much content yeah. that I knew that if I signed up for the class, there'd be a lot, a whole lot more right. of that. Stuff. What else could he possibly share? Like this was so detailed type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't intentionally do that either, to be honest with you, because I had conversations with my friends about how much to give right. as opposed to how much to keep secret. But right. ultimately I decided, you know, if I'm going to waste these, you know, if I'm going to bring all these people in, to sit with me for 90 minutes, I better put together a pretty decent performance. Right, right. So, Do you find that people going through your course try and copy you? You mean like, copy? Do, the, like, I mean, like, do, like, the same type of products. Because obviously they know your store, they know what you sell, they, they know you've yeah. been doing it for a while. Yeah, um, it's actually not that easy to knock off a store. I mean, it's not like knocking off a blog or a podcast or whatnot, mm -hmm. right? With a store, you have your vendor relationships, you have special pricing, mm -hmm. and then there's all the search rankings that you've just kind of gone through to get stuff to search for. You've got your content, you got your customer list and your email list, you've got your B2B customers yeah. that are loyal to you. So uh, the chances of knocking something off completely is going to be yeah. tough, yeah. I think. I ask that too because several people I know, you know, teach e-commerce courses and they don't share what they sell um, at all. And so I'm always curious. I'll tell you why that is. Yeah. Uh, so when you're selling on Amazon, you cannot tell someone what you're selling, right? Because someone will just go to a factory, produce that same thing, slap right. their own brand on it, and then they'll sell it. Because Amazon doesn't give you access to customers or what whatnot. So when you're selling on Amazon, you're just like another commodity right. to, to Amazon. Unless you have patents or whatnot and you're you're selling something truly unique. Mm -hmm. A lot of these Amazon sellers today, all they're doing is they're just importing some stuff, slapping their own brand on it, and then selling it. Mm -hmm. The exact same product. So that is not defensible in my opinion in the long run. Right. Since you, so you're saying because you guys do the a lot of custom stuff and people are coming through your website, we we do a lot of custom stuff. We have a customer base already. We have email addresses. Yeah. Uh, we have search engine rankings. Yeah. So those are things that are yeah. harder to replicate. Now, Steve, what are the biggest mistakes you see people making? You know, especially because you not only do it yourself, but you have students that you mm -hmm. teach. Yeah, so uh, number one mistake is spending too much time during the niche research part, like mm. figuring out what to sell. Really? It's, it's much easier since since you can get product really cheaply and in low quantities. It's better yeah. just to start with a variety of products, buy a certain quantity, throw them up on a marketplace and just see what sells. Mm -hmm. Second problem I see is that people don't really think about how they're going to stand out. 
in the crowd. Mm-hmm. They'll come in and they'll want to s- sell like T-shirts or baby products or something like that yeah. without even thinking about the fact that there's like thousands there's of other stores. a million other sell- ones. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's fine. It's cool to do that as long as they have something where they can stand out yeah. and put together some sort of value proposition for. Mm-hmm. So yeah. those are the two major mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk about the – I want to talk a little about the blog. You know, we talked a lot about the e-commerce um, in great detail. I love that. Um, you know, my wife quit her job. Um, talk about the course that you put together. What? How did you put it together? You know, um, and just a little bit about what people are getting most out of it now. Yeah. So what's what's funny about the course is I did actually not want I didn't want to develop it when I developed it. Yeah. I was just getting so many people that were emailing me saying, "Hey, Steve, you put together the course. I'm there." Mm. Right, and so I was like, "Okay." Is this because uh, you were just chronicling on the blog what you were going through? Is that why people? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, and so I ended up just doing like a uh, a webinar, and I just said, "Hey, I got no content, but if you pay me, I'll promise to put out content on a regular basis." Mm-hmm. The, that's kind of how it got started, and so I ended up selling. Um, 35 people on a course which I didn't have yeah. and at that point I was forced to create the material right and so in creating the material I pretty much walked through everything that we did to start our store and basically modeled the course after something that I would want to take right and so when you start a business everyone's business is completely unique right yeah even if we sell the exact same items, you're going to have your own set of problems and I'm going to have my own set of problems. So I knew that there would have to be some sort of live component to it yeah. in order to, to ensure that people succeed. And so I put down the commitment to hold weekly you know, live sessions. It's a big commitment. Yeah. yeah, to answer questions. Um, and so that's probably the most valuable part. The other valuable part, of course, are the forums where people get a chance to interact with other people doing the same thing. Because I know when my wife and I first started out, we didn't have anyone to talk to. Yeah. So all my friends are doctors, engineers, or lawyers. They have no interest in, in selling stuff online. Right. So it was it, it's just nice to have other people to talk to about the same things. Yeah. So that initial group, Steve, obviously you learned a lot from them and you improved it. What did you modify or add into the, the course because of the feedback you were getting from the, the first group? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have the forum at all in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And also, once people started launching their stores, they wanted to promote it. As they, they were having problems pro- promoting it as well. And yeah. so that actually also made me put together this special area where you can actually share your content and have other people help promote it for you. The other thing that I changed also is, uh, remember that I was just talking about having other like-minded entrepreneurs to work with. Yeah. So I started encouraging people to get together in little focus groups, mm. their own little masterminds, so to speak, where they get together on like a weekly basis and just kind of help each other through the process. Yeah. So those are the main additions. Yeah. Steve, it seems like everything's going awesome for you uh, on multiple facets. Um, what keeps you up at night now? That's a good question. So <laughs> I, we've, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but... All of this stuff, you know, e-commerce, blogging, and, and teaching, it, it's yeah. all fine and good. But in terms of like true mental stimulation, it's yeah. it just doesn't quite do it for me. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I still work my day job. So I, I design microprocessors for a living. And it's something that I've studied all my life, right? Mm-hmm. And it actually involves a lot of brain power to just kind of put together these designs. And so, so give my people next, an idea. Uh, give people an idea before you say that. Talk about so where do these microprocessors go and what do they do? Just so you know, people yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. visualize that. So if you look at your phone, for example, the stuff that I help design does like the audio audio processing for the phone. Uh, some of it does like the video processing mm-hmm. or the cellular data crunching functions. Mm-hmm. And so the stuff that I help design goes also into digital cameras, printers. All, mm. Basically, every device these days requires some amount of processing power. Right, right. And I guess it's pretty much unknown to a lot of people who just use their phones and, and it just works. We just assume like, we all, turn it on and it works, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like... That's Steve toiling of for hours a day, like making that work, <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah. So what keeps you up at night? You're saying the mental stimulation. Mainly the 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 balance between stimulating myself mentally as yeah. well as not sacrificing all of my time and and allowing some time for kids and family. Yeah. Essentially, um, it is kind of a deli- deli- uh, delicate balance because every now and then I'll get carried away with something with the business. And I'll spend too much time, and then yeah. I got to cut back, and then I cut back too much, and I realize the business is falling behind, and then I, it's, it's like a, a seesaw thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's tough. But what's your ultimate goal? I know you have big goals for hardware. Um, what What's your ultimate? Like, if you could just be in a lab with a lab coat and just create <laughs> whatever hardware wise, right? Because because eventually you want to create something really cool hardware wise. My dream would be to be able to just create something cool without any pressure of it ever having to make money at all. Yeah. Right? Just put something out there that's cool and yeah. and not having to raise money and having someone like yeah. making me do stuff. Right. And just doing it for fun. What would it look like? I mean, do you know do you have a vision of like I want to create this type of hardware or is that like top secret in your mind? I don't have anything yet. And what's funny is I was just talking with Manish uh, last week. Manish Sethi, uh, Pavlak. The right, Pavlak, yes, yes, right? yes. Um, if just no about, one knows what that is, it shocks you if you don't do something, right, that, yes. you, that you should be doing. Yeah. Right, right. So I was chatting with him about just how cool and how fun it is to, to just make something, Yeah. whether it be a wearable or, or something tangible. Right. And so that's just something that I, I know I want to do eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when it hits you, nothing's hit you yet, as you're saying. Like when, when you have that urge to, to have that itch to do it, then you'll do it, but nothing as of now. I kind of know how I would proceed mm-hmm. with developing something, right. but the actual functionality of what I want to do has not been determined yet. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you're like a mad scientist. You have like these papers like I have like of like just you jot all these ideas down. Like do you have any idea pads of what – like when things come to you? I have Trello. Okay. What what are yeah. some things on there that maybe you're not doing that related to hardware software? Right? Yeah. Nothing right now. Nothing. Nothing right now. Nothing. Because mainly uh, right now work is kind of consumes my mind for that stuff, right? <laughs> everything now. consumes your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have different Trello boards for everything. Like I got one for the e-commerce store, the podcast and the blog. Yeah. Um, yeah. what needs to get done. So see, this has been hugely valuable. You know, I really appreciate your time. Obviously people would see you're a busy man. Um, my last question before I ask it, just point people, where should we send people online to check out more of what's going on with you? Yeah. So you can go to my wife, If you want to know more about what I'm about, you can write on that front page as a sign up form and I will send you a free six day mini course. Yeah on how you can start your own e-commerce business. Kind of walks you through the very basics. Yeah. Uh, you can check out my podcast, uh, where I interview a lot of different people, not necessarily on e-commerce. Uh, I interview just people across all different online business models. Yeah. And uh, Jeremy, you were just commenting that I have a style that's kind of like Andrew, where I just kind of get to the point. <laughs> You do. And uh, try to extract the information basically on how people got started with their businesses yeah. and every every step that they took. Yeah. And if you're engaged, I don't, I don't know how likely your listeners are going to be engaged. I'll hook you up with some hankies if you can check out my store at <laughs> bumblebeelinens.com. Um, yeah, check it out. I love it, Steve. Yeah. And so my last question, you know, since the Skubani e-commerce mastery series, um, what should we leave people with? What are some of the best actionable tips to take you know take action on right now to increase their e-commerce business. Yeah, so here's the thing. Here's the shift that I'm seeing. So yeah. because Amazon is kind of commoditizing product sales, I think it's more important than ever to actually go out and establish your own presence or your own brand so to speak. And so I think it's important to just put out content and you know, for a blogger, that's easy to do. But for some reason, a lot of e-commerce stores don't think that way. Mm-hmm. You know, put out content. So, by putting out content on a regular basis, you're kind of establishing mind share. Yeah. And once you have that mind share and that email list, it makes selling a lot easier. Um, let's say you want to start and sell a, a completely different product. Yeah, give a few examples. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, we sell hankies, right? And by getting their mind share and and an email list, whenever I want to launch a new product. And I want to just get instant sales. I can mm. just send out an email, and they might just buy from me just because they like me or my story. 
right? right? It becomes a little bit less about the product and more about who they're buying from. Right. Right. And I think in order to stay relevant in the long haul, you kind of have to establish that mind share. That relationship, yeah. 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 Great advice, Steve. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Take care.